Well, welcome everyone. I just wanted to sort of thank uh, Brooke and Andrew for having us here. I think that's fantastic. And also Nutrisoil for sponsoring this. Like, uh, I think that the more we can do and start leading and making people successful, uh, the more that uh, this will take up and change and, and that. And the big problem is that there's very, very low success rate with a lot of this training. So I've studied all that. So with the grazing training, um, with other forms of training, the success rate's around about 5% of the people trained. So we need to know why and we need to start looking at it. So um, I'm involved with uh, Holistic Management International, doing a lot of work for them. And one of the things I'm doing is a, a mentoring and coaching thing for them. They want to sort of improve the adoption and success. And I got tasked with that idea, how do we improve, improve people's success? And I started last June with a group, um, which fitted with COVID on Zoom. And I started with weekly phone calls and emails and monthly webinars, and that didn't engage. So then I went to fortnightly webinars and ended up at weekly. And I only barely limped into Christmas time. I just about popped a hose, so. Um, <laughs> It was just exhausting and stuff, but it, it worked. It's one of the most successful things I've ever done. And the other one is to have people live in, um, I've sold the farm now in Southwest Victoria, but have live in for three to four days with trained animals with enough infrastructure that they could do it and they actually embed it. And I don't say very much and people then say, oh, what about, oh, and they've got all this problem because what they can see is it's working in front of them. And I'm pretty confident we need everyone to get to that stage that's interested in doing that. So when people come, they can embed it. So um, Savory Institute, I trained with Alan in 1996, so not yesterday. And I'd been doing grazing management for about uh, seven years before that and still involved with Stiper, although sort of um, it's become a little bit exhausting for me. So it was sort of writing the newsletter yeah, step one, get membership, step two, write newsletters. It was like that, it was just, yeah. So we're gonna talk about that. So um, I registered Stiper as a, uh, a not-for-profit charity, but couldn't get the uh, DGR status because of the whole, um, they thought we were an environmental, not a production in uh, business. So we fell into that pool of, um, that uh, the current government doesn't like and wouldn't give us DGR status. But yeah, we can auspice that and stuff. So jump in at any stage. I'm not gonna do a lot today, but I will cover whatever you want. So I've only got two things that I really want to do, is how do you work out what combination of, gra uh, of recovery, stock density and utilization rapidly regenerates your land? And that's through this. This is safe to fail practice areas, which I got from a guy called Dave Snowden from Cognitive Edge, and he understands complexity. And in a complex domain like farming, you can only see the patterns by doing these safe to fail trials or practice areas. A lot of people don't like the word trial, so I changed it to practice areas, and they go, oh no, I'm happy with practice areas. I go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like so. so as long as people do that, but we'll, we'll need to learn why we need to do that. We need to know how to monitor the land, how to know that you're getting better. So I use landscape function analysis, uh, which is CSIRO, David Tongway and Norm Hindley developed. It's peer reviewed blue ribbon overhead foxtail science. So it's published. I started using it. I had a um, Mark Gardner called it my sabbatical when I went and worked for the DPI, uh, which I, I feel like I'm working, Mark. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but because it was Australian re peer-reviewed science, they couldn't argue with it, and it works really well, and I'll go through that. I can talk about the fencing and water and the animal performance and the weed. The reason I've put those four things up is because I talk about them differently than the other trainers. So I've try, I'll try and stick to what's different about what I'm saying. So some of this will be a bit shocking, and I've been doing this whole thing that it gives me no pleasure to let you know that I've spent 30 years trying to make grazing fail safe and work all the time, 
and I've worked it out and it ain't fun. It is very, very inconvenient and it takes a lot of commitment. But I can tell you how to make it work if you want to do it. So, but and we've got those others. I have a specific focus. Some would say prickly, but I have a, I have a focus. <laughs> Sorry, Beck. The, um, I have a focus that most of the practices I hear and see and study are only slowing the car down as we're heading over the cliff of environmental collapse. I'm not interested in that. I keep saying, if we're not going to turn around, if we're not going to do a handbrake turn, then let's gun it and have fun. You know, let's just put the pedal to the metal and, and like people that know me know I do try and have fun. So, um, but that's different. So there's a whole heap of practices that we need to do in the interim, but I'm not the person for those. So if you want to know certain topics, I will not cover them because they don't turn the car around. And that can be a bit confronting and I can explain why they don't turn the car around. Um, this is my definition of regenerative ag, and it must be outcome-based. Outcome it can't be practice-based. People, high wellbeing scores and actively promoting agriculture. Uh, the high wellbeing scores is sort of in the Sue Ogilvy, Mark, uh, Mark Gardner report, sort of. So it's a, it's, a, it's a methodology of going through a questionnaire or a survey. And it's actually, they've got enough data that they can sift through it. And what we're finding is that regenerative farmers have a higher physical and mental well-being score. But what I picked up when I was doing lots of drought work was there was a big difference between those, and this was around Wagga and those sort of areas, and it was during a drought and we were doing it with, I was doing it with Sydney University. They were actively promoting agriculture. They were setting it up for the next generation. So there was two types. One type, the best thing is the kids don't want to be farmers. And I'd say, me being me, I'd say, that's the best thing? <laughs> Do you know, like, really? <laughs> yeah, like so. And the other ones were they were actively setting it up for their kids and others. So that's really important that this is going well. Profit increasing. Do you know, it's not a hard bar. I promise on my website I'll increase your profit 10, 10 times. Because like, you know, 10 times nothing, still nothing. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not a hard thing to do. So we need to know that we need our profit. And I'll talk about what the design is to increase profit and keep money in your bank. I had a group on Monday night and they're all croppers around Caniva in Western Victoria. And I, because I said that, um, the problem is if you have a good year, you increase the risk of your business and you make the business worse because you go out and buy a new machine to not pay tax, which has increased your debt, which is the primary driver of failure in agriculture. So it goes debt, rainfall, market price in that order. So we need to know about that. And land, increasing in landscape function and biodiversity. There's too many trade-offs. Everyone that I work with, they're always trying to go, Graham, it's about balance. And it's a trigger word for me. It's sort of jumps my blood pressure, I reckon, by 50 points sort of thing. Because it's always the land that pays. It must improve with everything you do. The only way to increase these and get that centre there is that every new practice must reduce your inputs, reduce your costs and lower your risk. Because that's why we're failing at the moment. So if you're doing a new practice and it's got to have a machine or it's got to have this, you've got to go, no, no, hang on a minute and reassess it. This is what the picture is. So this is ABARES and um, RBA online data. So this is debt, the red one's debt. I used to have this graph only up to here and it looked like debt was coming back and the gross value of farm production was going to catch it, but I go, but it's kicked away. <laughs> like, so debt is just going berserk. If Australia was your farm, what this is showing is that if you live long enough, you will go broke. If Australia as a whole was your farm, because this is the gross value and this is the net value. This is what Abares quotes all the time. They never quote this one. It's in the data. 
you can go and check that it's all their data, it's not mine. Because I keep saying, you know, debt became self-aware somewhere around about here. Do you know, but not everyone's seen the Terminator movies I've found. So it's the tail wagging the dog. So we need to, what we need to do is decrease the gross value of farm production, increase the net and decrease the debt. That's the only way out of here. So when people say, oh yeah, but I do better than that, and the top 5% do, but that means the other 95% are worse than this. Do you know, we need to know this is the whole of Australia consolidated data. It ain't pretty. So when the agronomists or the DPIs or whatever say to me, oh, we don't agree, I go, I really don't care. It doesn't work. You know, what you're doing at the moment doesn't work. So how are you going to get out of it? So I won't do too much of this. So I got that line about if you live long enough from Tim Hutchings. He did his uh, PhD on risk in agriculture at C CSU. And he said to me, you know, with a sheep cropping farm in the Riverina, if you live long enough, you will go broke. And I wanted him to do it again, because like I wanted to record it. You know, because it was just so powerful for me. That, but it's about minimising losses. So you've got to focus on that risk. It's not about maximising production. If your consultant, agronomist, grazing trainer, anyone says, I will increase your production, get another one. It's the wrong focus. We want them to say, I will increase your profit and put money in the bank and improve your well-being and regenerate your land. So be really clear, because you will hear it, and it sings to the souls of men production. <laughs> if you're a Y chromosome carrier, that's all you can hear. <laughs> See, you know, it's like whales in the ocean singing away. <laughs> it is just ridiculous. You've got to know you cannot do that. You've got to spark on it and say, why is he talking to me about production? Well, why is she talking to me? Why, is, why, are, why are our tax dollars funding people to come out of universities to talk about maximising production? To sell you something. Exactly. And that's what this is. The gap between here and here is agribusiness and interest from the banks. They are not your mates. I used to do a really tough thing with people, ask them about whether, and I'll, don't nod or anything, just ignore me. The, um, I'd ask them, you know, are you friends with your fertiliser salesman? And get them nodding, and then I would say, do they let you know when the boat or is going to be late or the price is going up? And so I'd get them nodding, yeah, he's a mate, yeah. And then I'd say, well, that's a marketing technique. It's called prompting. So you tell him you will pay for it at that price when you want to pay for it. You've got to take control back. So then they're doing um, what they believe is right and what they've been taught at university. So th we have a really big issue with the whole way we're teaching agriculture and stuff. A friend of mine in Tasmania who, uh, you know, who's a you know, biodynamic perma no, sorry, permaculture designer, organic, you know, that's all her daughter had ever grown up with, went to UTAS and did agronomy and came out speaking agronomy. She came out with the language changed. So, and she only had one exposure her whole life. So, um, yeah, so debts, this will just be in there, but you really need to think about that. How do you design away from all of these things? These are design questions. They're not a problem. Most things are only about design. So debts, number one, seasonal or rainfall market price. This is a, a design away from it. So keep 20% debt on the land and no debt on the cows. So when these people that I've got this from are buying more land, they just adjust cows and calves, set stopped on the new property until they breed up their own heifers to then push the others out. So they've got this design that they never ever are exposed to debt, rainfall or market price risk. The seasonal risk is by long recoveries with one mob. And the market price is a very, very low cost of production. That's a model that works. We know it works. 
and we've got lots of data on it. So landscape function analysis. David Tongway here, and he's teaching Colin Sice and myself. So I'm mates with Colin and through Colin with Gabe Brown and all that sort of stuff. And I've got his quote of what he learned from me when he came over here on, the, on my email. I was always embarrassed about that stuff. And I go, oh, I'm getting too old to be embarrassed. Just put it there. Yeah, because people say, oh, what do you know, Graham? I go, Gabe Brown says he learnt from me. <laughs> you know, like, uh, what else is there? Yeah. So, um, so this is Colin and I and David Tongway teaching us how to do these transects and how to monitor the soil surface. This is really important stuff. This is reading the land. This is the science of reading the land. You'll hear people talking about it. So if you want the land to be stable and not eroding, if you want it to infiltrate water and not run off, and if you want it to cycle nutrients, you need to look at these things. I've, take, I've simplified it and just taken the five biggies. So one of the things is that this is the relationship. I do not see, well, I do not meet anyone that doesn't know that the land must be covered not to erode. Does anyone, can anyone perceive of someone like that that doesn't know that? Yeah, <laughs> but they believe it, but they don't practice it because they don't know how to do it. So we, yeah, like I work in high rainfall zones, we're continually ripping it up. You know, like if it's bumpy, if it's this, if it looked at you the wrong way, we'll go and plough it. Do you know, so I was from southwest Victoria, just south Branks home, just south of Hamilton and farmed there and took over a property that had been sold to Timbercore. Um, for that fantastic idea. So, um, oh, don't get me on the trees. The, um, so, if you want it to infiltrate water, this is starting to get a little bit more difficult. So, if you want it to infiltrate water, you've got to have about 30% plus of each hectare covered with mature perennial grass bases. And that is in David Tongway's research was around about four square centimetres. So two centimetres by two centimetres. And I'll show you how to measure that. So you want at least 30%. Alan Savory said the majority of land that he works on is less than 10. So we'll talk about that and how we do that. And I'll send the forms through Michaela or Brooke or whatever so that you've got how to measure that and um, material and stuff. It's also got to be covered with litter, you know, to slow those raindrops so that they can filter through and the surface needs to be rough. So they're the three big things that impact water infiltration. Big perennial grass bases, that was new for me when David Tongway was teaching me. I was looking at seedlings, young plants and mature plants and monitoring that but not that I needed to know how much of each hectare was covered with the basis of perennial grasses. At about 30%, you actually start to get this resilience to drought. If you maintain that, as soon as it rains, it's grass again. Like at Naringla, uh, down at Araluan, people know Araluan, do you know, uh, turn right at Braidwood and head down the hill into the valley sort of thing. I'm not going to say anything, I was going to be cheeky. The, um, yeah, so it's out there, but as soon as it rained, Peter and Anya had grass coming out of the drought. And the other people uh, were still feeding through that winter, whereas we were full back onto production and skipped over the drought. And I'll try and show that as well. So basal cover of perennial grass, really important. And it's about it's not about the tops. We're always into showy stuff, like wood in trees and things. It's about the root system, that fibrous root system. If you want to have healthy soil, it's got to be about the, how much of that root system is in there. So you can graze it and still measure landscape function. It's not about biomass, it's about that. And if you get enough density of those perennial grasses, you won't have to worry about the Bathurst burr, the whatever and things like that, because it'll be weed suppressive and resilient. So the problem is never too much weed. The problem is not enough perennial grass. You've got to change and think differently about this. 
So I get people, I go only look at the perennial grass and it's a bit zen for them. Do you know, like I'm going, don't look at the other things. And then they'll go, I go, don't look. You know, so you're trying to get people to look at the things you do want, not the things you don't want. How do I, in this paddock, how do I increase the perennial grass? It is hardly ever kill the weed to get more perennial grass. I can only think about one in a hundred times that that would be the right practice to take. And when is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this... Well, it's, uh, it's only if you were going to go broke and you could, but like you, but the trouble is then you spend money and then you go broke anyway. So everyone says, if I do that, it'll reduce my uh, gross income. And I go, yeah, but it'll increase your net. And that's what you pay your debts with and your interest and your inputs and stuff. If you can step from one perennial grass that's four centimetres squared to another, it's under... 20%, 10% sort of thing. If you're starting to do this, stepping from one to another, just half a step, it's about 30. And when it gets to 60%, like we do with the Stiper members, you're struggling to find a spot that you're not putting your feet on. Even though it says 60, it's like as if it's full. You know, you've got to kick the plants out of the way so that you're standing between them. So, uh, so if this is bare ground, and this is full perennial grass. So then, you know, through here, you've got your burrs and your forbs and your annual grasses, you know, maybe not in this, air, you know, this order. And then you go up into, um, you know, sort of those better weeds, sort of the weedy perennials um, that you might want, and then you get to there. If, if you're getting too low at impact, you'll get woody plants. So that's from too low. And these are from too short a recovery. So you need to know what you've got. What I really like is that some people are clever enough to have both things going on in the one paddock. And I go, gee, that's clever. <laughs> Do you know, so what they're doing is they're usually the animals will be camping on one area, like let's say down the front on the, on the river flats, but not going up the back. So that'll be going woody, and down here will be going thistly, burry, stuff all that sort of stuff yeah so then yeah so uh, and that's how i really like we can yeah, yeah, yeah the whole the whole disaster so you need to know that's about impact stock density and that's about recovery you cannot grow those things with uh the unless you have your recovery too short so you need to know that's what it's telling you so when you start to get a few of those you increase your recovery. What we need to learn is that we need to be more adaptive. We're too stuck. This is never about the right stocking rate or the right recovery or the right density. It's not like that. It does not work like this. As you build litter, you've got to increase stock density to keep it decomposing. You know, so it's always up for grabs. My eldest son looked after the place for sort of two years, and he said, oh, Dad, you just can never relax. <laughs> and I go, oh, I think he's got it. Do you know, like, so, so, and the other thing, just while I'm going, is that you're always planning for the next season. You're not planning for here what's in front of you. So at the moment, we, at home, when we were farming, I'd be planning to make as, have as much leaf area as possible on the perennial grasses so that when I hit spring, I always had a big spring. So that might mean reducing your stocking rate into spring. And you could imagine that was just considered the weirdest thing. They thought I was pretty weird, but that was one of them. Not taking the heifers ever out of the mob and that, that would just really upset people. So we'd be selling animals into the grass, the spring craziness. You know, so selling high. Do you know, like I go, I don't see what the problem is here. So, um, yeah, so the, let's do that again. So stability, soil cover and litter cover. This litter cover has got to be grown from the perennial grasses. When we go outside, we'll have a look and then for Water infiltration, basal cover, litter cover, and surface roughness. 
Surface roughness has got to be about 8 to 25 mils over each metre and you just measure what's the difference between the lowest point and the highest point over a metre. It's not as important as long as you don't go and, oh it's too rough to drive the ute at 80 k's, I'm going to plough it up. Because if it's rough, it'll probably be going okay. And you want it to be between the bases of these perennial grasses and the litter decomposing. So we want roughness. So roughness is one of the real biggies. And then for nutrient cycling, which is uh, where most of us males live, we need this basal cover of perennial grass. So it's that pumping of the sugars, the liquid carbon pathway, the Christine Jones. So that's what provides the habitat. That healthy perennial grass's root zone also provides all the insect killing fungi and stuff. So if you had cockchafers or pasture pests or corby grubs in Tasmania. I'd never heard of corby grubs until I went down there. But that, that's in here. And then you need the litter decomposing. It must be composting in situ. You must grow your litter, then decompose it and in situ. That's how we fill in the gaps between the big basal areas. So healthy land has big basal perennial grass cover, so more than 30%, and decomposing litter between it and the next one. That's what healthy land looks like. We need to know that and we need to have it in us because at the moment it's not getting through. You know, I've been trying to bang on about this stuff for 20 years. Occasionally I get prickly. And so, and it's just, we need to know that that's what's going on here. Can you see all those? It's very simple. If you understand that, you will be able to walk on any land and tell whether it's getting better, if it's regenerating or not. The quick one I do, and this, I did it on the bus at the conference, the holistic management conference we had at Albury, was that the roadside should not be better than your paddocks if you're regenerating. And it was stunning. I could see it stunned people. And specifically, it should have higher landscape function inside your paddock than on the roadside. Because this decomposing litter is formed by animals pushing it onto the soil surface with their feet and muzzles. So we need to know that it's about the litter. There was a guy I did um, down at the Tukey Trout Farm or something, and he said, oh, I get it, Graham. It's a, ba it's a lot of rot. <laughs> yeah, I got here. Very clever, very clever. So this is um, decomposing litter. It has that brown cover. This one, the photo doesn't show it, but that had visible fungal attack or being colonised by the beneficial uh, fungi. We need those decomposing fungi. We need, can you see how fibrous and stuff it is? This is George Taylor up at uh, Mumblebone and looking at that litter. And it's got to be like pulling Velcro out of the soil when it's going really well. You could hit it with the fire hose and no soil would shift. You need to know that's what it looks like and that's how it happens. So uh, that was at our place. This is out at um, Cobar. And I said to the guy, we will find a spot that you've got decomposing litter. And then I'm going, oh, I might have overcooked this. And we found it. This was a double hinged uh, goat gate that they used to round up goat yard, uh, goat yard, sort of to catch goats. And this one was closed and it had decomposing litter in it. It was the only green perennials we found on over 10,000 hectares of driving. And it was the size of the table, less than the size of the table. So there, but as soon as he saw it though, he knew that he could create it. And I think that's what we need to do. So this is that visible fungal attack. That's what, you know, if you go into healthy bush in the right environment, you'll pull the leaf and bark litter apart and you'll see it. In a healthy compost heap, you'll pull it apart and see it. It should be in the base of all our ag. There's a step increase in nutrient cycling when you go from slight decomposition, which is like that, to moderate decomposition, which is like that. There's a step increase. I like to tell my David Tongway story. He goes, you will not get it in grasslands, Graham. So 
me being me, every time I found it, I took a photo and sent it to him. And have I identified it correctly, David? Yes. <laughs> he had never seen good grazing anywhere. And then, you know, by the second photo, you were saying, that'll do. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> He's fantastic. It's like, uh, it's better than Google because he interprets the question and gives you, you know, like 50 years of soil science. I just, yeah, it is just the best thing to talk to David Tongway if you ever get a chance to hear anything that he's done or see any of his presentation. This is Gabe Brown soil. Um, so that, we need to know about leaf emergence. You need to go home and study the way a perennial grass grows. You need to know about this leaf emergence. It's all over the dairy industry, but they never ever, so with perennial ryegrass, it has three actively growing leaves. And then for the fourth leaf to emerge, that one dies and becomes litter. That's what we've got to do. We've got to go through that cycle. This is driven by moisture and temperature, not by fertiliser. You get wider leaves with nitrogen, you don't get faster emergence. And that's when the plant, when it's got litter, because we've got to build landscape function every time we go into the paddock, because what happens is the soil's continually decomposing and eating this litter. You've got to feed it all the time. So we need to know that. And so this is what this is about. The other one leaf, two leaf, three leaf, four leaf. And then as that leaf four is coming up, that one's dying and becomes the litter. But you've got to be really cautious about what the dairy industry recommends. I do that. Yeah, we've got an experiment in southwest Victoria that shows that our three leaf ryegrass grazing doesn't doesn't work that's they're trying to eat it before that one dies and be, and we call it the dairy industry so because the experiment shows that they don't make money i'm working with people now and they've taken a third off their cost of production they're buying more land and they're doing things that are going the wrong way as far as the advisors would be concerned they're giving them older grass that's recovered. They're selecting cows that in perform on that. They're going for moderate milkers, low maintenance energy. They're changing away from the, you've got to get these high producing cows. They're not the most profitable. It's only the moderate producers that are profitable. And then you've got to feed them recovered grass to keep their rumen stable. And I'll keep coming back to that. Um, this is the, how a, a grass plant grows and what it does um, is that it's ready to be grazed when it looks like an ungrazed plant and contain, contains fresh litter. So it'll be yellowy colour and we'll try and find some. We then graze it severely because our domestic grazers are severe grazers. So this is one of the points that people might pick up that I'm different from others. I'm saying graze it to the ground as hard as you can. Johann Zietzmann would say non-selective grazing. Uh, Jaime Elizondo would call it total grazing. Graham Han just says that's the right grazing. You've got to do that. It does not work to try and just skim graze. It's in the research. It's really clear. Uh, Andre Voison wrote about that it doesn't work in practice because the animals eat the plants they like and eat them down before they go onto the plants they like less. So if you only try and skim graze it, those plants they like less won't get grazed, but the, the better plants will have been grazed flat. So that's where you would increase your animal impact, like smaller to make them eat that? Yeah, so you, it's, it's, a, this, it's a dance between that stock density and to get your animal impact and your utilisation. And as your animals are adjusting and you're getting um, epigenetic change through, the, through time because those ones have grown up on it and stuff like that, it'll get better. But you can't push them too hard too early because you won't get animal performance. It's a bit hard to get that when you're trading. It and is. And a gisting, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Graham, we've always been told what you take off the top, you know, you take off the bottom. Like, that was the old yeah. science. Yeah, you know, yeah. How can, how can you reconcile that? Yeah, because some, see, I, I disagree with quite a lot of people that you know. I, there's, only, there's only a few of us, Gabe Brown, but he doesn't talk about it and didn't write about it in his book. And I've got a quote from him um, up further because I go, how come you didn't talk about this in your book? Because you said in the car to me that, 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 
And he said, no, that's right. That's exactly what I do. High utilisation in 14 to 15 months recoveries. And that leave the third, transfer third, like yeah. you're saying nothing. No, I'm saying as hard as you can while getting animal performance. So there's a difference. And as the animals adjust, you can go deeper. But initially, they will not be the type that performs. So I know the Angus... Angus breed pretty well and the trouble is over time what we've done is we've selected for higher maintenance requirements so their their value has fallen like that but the value for the feedlots has gone like that I wrote that in a stiper newsletter so we've lost value from the farmers so they have to feed them more so if you read any of those sort of breed societies they'll go oh with the new genetics I also had to shift to loosen and stuff and you're back at my graph at the front. The only long-term profitable thing for grazing is perennial grass. Gabe Brown cannot make money out of grazing only with covers. And I don't know anyone that's better at cover cropping than Gabe. It's just ridiculous. If he can't do it, why are we thinking we can do it? <laughs> you know, I go, but that, I've been saying that for 10 years too, and no one's caught on. <laughs> you know, like I go, but yeah, so then it mobilises its root reserves, so uh, its water-soluble carbohydrates, and starts putting up fresh leaf. So if, as it, if the animals come back here and graze that, you will get metabolic disease. So you'll get scours in your calves, low dung scores, feet problems, high cell count in dairy cows. Most metabolic problems are caused by eating grass that's too young. And did you say to yeah, so I coming back too soon or no? It could have been somewhere else. Over. Well, I th I'm not sure because see, I usually give loosen and stuff. I go by definition, a plant that kills animals isn't animal food. So, but I have gone to so many farms and they're embarrassed because there's a cow dead in the loosen paddock. Do you know? Like, oh, I haven't had time to get it. And I always say, you do know by definition, if it kills them, it's not food. <laughs> yeah, like that. And they all, oh, what is he talking about? So, so this is where you have overgrazing. This is overgrazing. This is grazing leaf that's gr actively growing from root reserves. So this is overgrazing. So, and I want to come back to what you and I were talking about, Brooke, but I'll finish this first. That... Um, this is where most of the problems come from, grazing these plants here. We need to get that second bite thing out of your head because most people are just being just confused by it. Don't worry about the second bite on the way down, but if the plant regrows and you bite it again, then it's overgrazing because you're grazing and depleting these root reserves. And in the growing season, what sort of a time frame is that? Well, in our environment, what did, like it's about a month at the moment here. Oh. Yeah. Do you know, so in spring it might be down to a fortnight, mm -hmm. maybe a week. I, I work with people that set stock then and lamb down, and I agree that's the best thing to do. And the pasture doesn't fall apart. And they're in there for, what, six weeks or whatever before they mark them. So we, we've been... The, and this is what I'd like to just... Can I just say... Failure is from coming back too quick, not staying too long. Mm -hmm. If you stay too long, you'll overgraze a few of these plants that got grazed early. If you come back too quick, you overgraze 100%. So instead of, say you stayed for a month in spring, you'd overgraze 20, 30, 50. But if you go around and come back too quick, you overgraze 100 that's where failure is. I never see people fail from going too slow. So that definition um, of perennial grass is on the next slide. So when it looks like an ungrazed plant, so no cut off tips and contains fresh yellow litter. So this is four leaves. It's probably in ryegrass needs to be six to 10 to get enough litter. So it's this definition that you can go out and pluck a plant and actually say, yes, my better grasses have recovered. I just use sweep my foot and look for it. And we'll go and make sure that we do that. 
but it's this whole cycle. So now you effectively wouldn't kill that grass plant, but you wouldn't build landscape function. Yeah. And then you build landscape function here because you need that decomposing litter for about... So at the same surface roughness, you get about 50% of your nutrient cycling from the basal area of the perennial grasses and 50% from the decomposing litter, the composting between the plants. So once you understand that, you go, oh, okay. So you need to know that we need to grow this litter every time before we come in. And this is, you know, when I said about it, it gives me no pleasure. Do you know, I go, oh, because that's quite a long time in, at different times of the year. So with your spring, I'm getting people that are uh, lambing in spring um, in Western Victoria and Caniva, and it's all annual but they're only going, coming back to that lambing paddock again uh, 12 months later to lamb again, and that's shifting. But he doesn't like it. He wants to do something in spring because it's easier to put them off shears. Yeah, like, and I go, well, you're going to have to make these decisions. It's like when you were saying about the lambing and the calving. We've got to make a decision. This is not negotiable. We will not have a future if we can't increase landscape function. This is not about a nice to have, do you know? Like, and we can't let the land spin down. So then you'll build landscape function. It's, it's tucker that will give them good dung scores. It'll be grass that goes, doesn't go roaring through them. If the grass is too young here, just quickly, it's just an animal health, you get uh, ammonia comes across the rumen wall because it's, it's not, they're not true amino acids, so it's non-protein nitrogen at that stage. Comes across there into the bloodstream as blood urea nitrogen, then goes milk urea nitrogen, which then changes the conditions in the lamb or the calf. They will get scours from this. The cows or the ewes will be dirty bottoms as well and scouring, because that grass goes straight through them and rips the lining off the guts, which allows the worms to get in. Do you know, like, so you just go, there is no evidence that any of this goes the other way. And then what happens is with those, um, those young stock while they're feeding off mum, is they get this rumen change which sets up the conditions for that other E. coli, the scours and things like that, which then lowers their immunity, where they again, then get pneumonia, then they die. That's how you, if you want to kill them, I can do it. I know how to do it. If you want to kill your lambs and calves, this is what you do. You give them that grass. And I've done it. Do you know? And uh, my wife at the time said, well, if they're going to die, we're not going to have them. And I go, oh, I'm going to have to get focused. And then I say, I don't want you to think I wasn't in charge at home. So, but <laughs> she said, we're not going to have animals if they're dying. Yeah, so what Colin does is he's always battling. Perennial grasses control the ball in the soil. Once they're in there, they control the water, they control the nutrients, they control the game. So what Cole does to beat that is that he overgrazes. He deliberately overgrazes. Then he sprays with Basdo or a, a desiccant type herbicide. Then he uses knife points because these Perennial grasses are still controlling the game. They've still got hold of the nitrogen and the moisture. It then uses knife points rather than discs, so he gets enough tilth. So, and then, because he's also, sorry, waited till it's frosted, till the C4s are shut down. So, Joe, you know, this is multiple, multiple beatings of the perennial grass to get pasture cropping to work. And it's a long list, and not everyone gets the list, is what I've found. So if you want pasture cropping to work, I don't know how to do it in C3s. I've only ever seen it work once in uh, winter growing grasses and it was a phalaris pasture and there was one here and then there was one over there. Like to me, it was an, it was an annual pasture with a few phalaris plants in it. So there was no way I could step from a phalaris plant to a phalaris plant. So that's the only time I've seen planting cereals into C3 works. So in theory, if your grass is shut down hard enough in summer, if you've got winter growing or summer growing grasses. Uh, it's, it's a mix, but we've got winter growing grasses. Yeah, so I'm, I'm saying I would do a small little trial, but unlikely to work. I've never been able to get it to work without using herbicides and stuff like that. So, yeah. So has everyone got this in their head? Everyone got the definition in their head? Um, 
This happens really quickly. This is work we did supervised by Sydney University through Stiper. Um, and within two years, this was a gateway um, and it was all bare ground. And I, need to, I was thinking about this last night. I need to change it from before and after rather than treatment and control. But this went back to chocolate cake in, in two years. So if you just focus on that, you, on increasing landscape function, you can fix these things in a year to two year with grazing only. Um, so I just wanted to say these, I was always taught, you know, like uh, it took us 200 years to wreck it, it's gonna take us 400 years to fix it. That's completely wrong. It's incredibly inspiring to know that you can do that. Like you could have eaten this. This was just full of organic matter. Um, I won't worry about this at the moment, but I usually talk about this, what can we try? So in the complex domain, what can we try? Here, it's just obvious, everyone agrees. This is um, David uh, Snowden's Kneffen framework. So he's Welsh, so he's got to give it a Kneffen uh, Welsh name. So, um, so you can sort, this is how I triage decisions for people and what's going on. So if it's obvious, everyone agrees, like it might be a work instruction, you know, driving on the right side of the road, you know, whether it's holding the man or, oh no, dropping the ball, no, that's different, is it? <laughs> um, so, but it, it's just really simple stuff. So it's hardly a problem usually. Most people have worked it out. This one here is if it's complicated, you can get an expert. So this is law, tax, you know, some of the medicine, not all of it, but some of the medicine. And if it's complex, which agriculture is, the only way you can get to glimpse the patterns is to do the safe to fail trials. So what can we try? And then when it's, you know, the animals are dying or a pandemic's breaking out, you've just got to act. So I talk about Jacinda because I find that doesn't upset people as much as talking about Australia. Well, it does upset some, obviously, but she acted. Do you know, she did something. And that's what it's about. You've got to act and then feed back, whereas people stop feeding back on themselves. So if it's all in chaos, you've got to do something so that you've got enough time to then start doing the trials. So if your animals are dying, what are you going to do? I typically, when people ring me up, I shotgun it and just give them a whole list of things to try. And if one of them worked, then we do the trials to work out, well, what was it? But most of the time it's because the grass was too young. So I'm trying to sop that up somehow with that non-protein nitrogen. So if you're not sure what to do, you've got to work out whether it's complicated. This would be, you know, um, how do, what size pipe do I need to get enough water to the animals in the middle of summer? You would go and ask a water engineer. You go and ask an expert. This is what combination of animal types and enterprise design and grazing is going to reduce my risk and allow me to have that um, improve the land and get it going. So I said I wasn't going to talk about it and then I did, sorry. <laughs> um, so this is really powerful. I, have, I am pushing back against mindset. I believe that Tony Robbins has got a lot to answer for. So I'm saying, do this, it's easier to act. And what we'll do is we'll look at that safe to fail trial. It's the next smallest step if you want to improve your grazing. I've got lots of data. When we go to that, no matter where we are, it all starts going the right way. Once you've got a process of sorting things out. So um, this is sort of a, uh, a guy that's been working with me on that mentoring program. He's in Somaliland. So I, I gave him a um, scholarship to be in on, um, in on that sort of program where we're doing the once a week sort of stuff. And it's really changed. Lately it's about, I go, well, what's wrong with that slide? It's like I feel like I'm talking to camera or something or, or, or talking to the audience now rather than presenting. And I just say, well, what's wrong with that slide? And they go, well, we don't like that. And they're co-designing with me. So we got we're down to that last 20% of questions rather than the big 80% of how do I make this work. 
and then the, each week they go and try something and come back and think, well, that didn't work. And I, and I go, well, you know, so they get them to send in photos and we can do it and discuss it. It works really well. So this is in Somaliland, you know, really degraded land, lots of conflict. Alan Savory's degraded land leads to um, social unrest. It's not linear and it's not predictable how it respond. So I'll show you because it's just incredible. It's like this non-wedding sands in southeast South Australia, where this barely grew capeweed, these non-wedding sands, and just putting the animals in there, trampling it. They didn't dung everywhere, but the whole paddock came alive by spring. So this was autumn, this was spring. And this is, I was showing this to the cropping guys, because I said, when I showed this, they go, did you think of claying it as well, Graham? And I was looking, I, I was just flabbergasted because we did this at a profit, not $500 a hectare or whatever. Do you know, like, and it's more than that now for claying. You know, everyone know claying? They strip the topsoil off and then they scrape out the clay underneath you know, because the soil's been buggered it goes that duplex sort of type with a clay layer and stuff. Then they mix it all up in a giant machine and spread it all over the land and then work it in. You know, like a, so it, it is anti-regen. It's using so much fossil fuel, costs a fortune, or you can do this. These were heifers on the point of carving, so he wasn't comfortable to leave them overnight without something to eat. But the, it, the dung wasn't everywhere, but the grass grew everywhere. Yeah, but it was only for the night. He just rolled out a bale of silage for them. Yeah. And they were dense, very dense in there. So it was like a yard density. Yeah. And then we trampled it. And so this was all, you know, you poured water on it. It ran off. It didn't run in, you know. So like mercury sort of going across oh. the surface. Wow. Yeah, it was, it, because the first time I saw it, I went, yeah, I couldn't believe it because I'd never seen non-wedding sands. And they pour it on and just went, yeah, wait until it's recovered and then repeat. So this is always about repeat. We need to understand grasses can't drop their leaves. They're one of the few plants. They co-evolved with grazing animals. Do you know? And, we're, and it's like as if we go, oh, yeah, we can take it off and it'll get better. But it will not. It will change. So, so how long do you recommend that until you graze that again? I wouldn't graze that again until it was sort of... Yeah, for the following autumn could be a good one, but as a minimum at the end of spring. So, do you know, so when the growth has just about stopped, do you know? If so you graze that at the end of spring and it's straight coming into 30, 40 degrees, yeah. would you do that and then leave that in that depleted state over that summer? It wouldn't be in a depleted state, it would be covered with 100% litter okay. and, and perennial grass basal area. So the, I, I, someone said about the green all year round. Who was that before I get stuck in? I'm not a green all year round. A ruminant secret weapon is turning dry feed into high quality protein. I think we've got that wrong. And I go, because who gave the green feed all year round to the wildebeest? Do you know, to the diprotodons, to the... I think we've got a lot of wacky stuff going on. I think, I think it was more, I'm not defending that perspective, but it was more, what I had read was to provide those carbohydrates for sugars by yeah. the system. Yep. To the and, soil uh, biology. Yeah. More, so so G Gabe and I argued about this. Do you know, like, yeah. and I said, if it's expensive to have it green all year round, then it's better off to use the just dry feed. Because that's what the ruminants did. There's a lot of stuff that you just go, how did that work? My daughter and I were arguing about sort of different eco zones and things like that. And sort of she said, oh, there's a town where three eco zones meet. And I go, so when the big herd of diprotodon was coming through, they go, hang on a minute, everyone, hang on. We're going into a new eco zone. You'll have to change the grazing. Do you know, they didn't. They just walked straight through and ate it like they normally do. So I'll make sure I've got those uh, up. Can we quickly go outside just before lunch? So we do random throws. So I understand like this is a yard and things like that, but it, it's the same everywhere we go and we'll be able to look at it. So you do a random throw and then see what it landed in. I use a dart, but 
I forgot to take them out of my backpack to go through last oh. Thursday, last oh. Thursday oh. week ago. And they, they kept putting it through and they couldn't, and then they go, what's this? So, so I lost my darts. So normally you'd use a dart and typically on most land, you will find that it lands in bare ground, not a perennial grass plant or litter if it's well managed. So that would be typically, so we only do 10 throws and then we describe the soil surface around here. So this is bare and capped. It's got that cap on it. You don't need to dig it up. You can see the smooth, shiny surface and stuff like that. I didn't need to know whether it would come up like that or not. It will always be capped unless it's a self-mulching sand. So, do you know, self-mulching soil, sorry. That stops the air getting in, which stops your nutrient cycling. It stops the water going in, which stops your water infiltration. So you've got to have that area covered with decomposing litter that's open and friable and stuff. So we'd measure, we'd tick off the form, bare, capped, and then the distance to the nearest perennial we measure with a ruler. I had a friend that I took the 100 metre, you know, the big windy one, and he goes, what's that for? And I said, I had to do the plant spacing. <laughs> like, he didn't think I was funny at all. I, I thought I was hysterical. So um, I find I get that a bit. So you'd measure that distance, because if you're managing well, that'll be filling in with perennials. If your recovery is too short and your stock density is too low, that will be getting wider. So you think of a dairy farm, clumpy, clumpy grass, getting wider and wider, then they re-sow it. And they re-sow it in a frame that's, uh, they're re-sowing it more frequently than the payback period. So one of the big things is that they're doing that. So in Southwest Victoria, we had that monitor farm project. So if the average stock density was 16 DSC a hectare, hectare six was to do the pasture, pasture and feeding costs and then another two was for animal health and then you know so there was all these things so when I'd say I'm carrying 10 DSC rain hail or shine they go oh you're not having a go and I'd go well are you counting the four months that you feed for because it's about the same you know as what if you're not feeding as soon as you cut hay you quadruple its cost in cents per kilogram dry matter it is not an ongoing option, but it's a hard one to manage and get off. So can you see that? So we've got good perennial density. So there's these perennials are there. So you can see all those ones are there, but there is no litter between it. So you're not growing the litter between each grazing event to fill in those spots. All the litter, and you can comb it out, is up in the air and not on the soil surface. So in here, you, and if you go down into it and dig through it, you'll see that the ground's not, it's not as bad as out there. It's not capped and stuff, but it's not got deep litter in it. It's still open and friable, so it's much better than out there. But this litter is all going up there into the air. So if it's not getting cycled, and you need to look at some of the different colours and stuff in here. So there's different colours. So there'll be grey oxidising litter where the, it'll be that grey colour and not a yellow colour. And that grey colour means the carbon's going up into the air and not into the soil. So we're looking at these plants and sort of trying to say, so each plant like that, has it gone through and has it got fresh yellow litter? That's what the litter looks like. And you've got to have enough of that litter to cover the ground 100%. So when they come out, you've, they've eaten the green, excuse me, in the growing season, they've eaten the green and then they've pushed the litter onto the soil surface. So if you've got horses and sheep, they can pick up the litter quicker and easier than a cow because of their mouth structures. So most of that sort of thing is you've got to be a bit more onto it. With the cows, if you've got the recovery right, it's almost impossible for them. And if you use gut fills as you're scoring, they change quickly, their gut scores, their gut fills change quickly when they go from eating green to eating litter or picking up litter. And they go hollow really quick. On this left-hand side, in the paralumbar fossa is what the, my 
that's my sort of Latin-y thing, not very good at it. Um, so it's that sort of stuff. So you'd be looking in here, you need to graze it and push the litter onto the ground. So graze it at high stock density, leave the ground covered with, decom with this litter that then can decompose into the soil and it'll be like Velcro if it's good. You'll grab the litter, you'll grab it and you'll go like that and it'll come out in long fibre strings. That's when it's going well. And then as you manage it, so the stock density, the animal impact germinates the perennial grass seed bank and the utilisation clears all the growth points so that you've got enough time to have your longer recovery and then you leave it and come back and repeat. It is possible to regenerate land that you think is just impossible to regenerate, but you've got to get that combination of recovery, stock density and utilisation. That stock density has got to be at the point that they're behaving differently. If I got everyone and put them on this side of the fence and gave them 10 metres by 10 metres, you know, they might be a bit uncomfortable. If I halved that area, you'd be inside everyone's public, uh, personal space and your behaviour changes. So it's when people, when you think about this, it's the density that you would start giggling. Let's go in, hey? <laughs> this is Benjamin who's in Somaliland and they're grazing sheep in these cages because they have a problem with um, some sort of wild doggy thing but they also have a problem with people. So he was saying that this is my safe to fail area where he left the cage overnight. So there's a, there's a bit of a, this happening around the world like Alan does it Alan Savory does it at Divangombi, where they actually lock them up overnight to protect them from the predators. So similar thing, he's moving them in these cages and stuff. This area is the area that came back to that grass in one year. What you just saw is one year, we started June last year and I couldn't get him to do it. Do you know, and I'm going, what is it, Benjamin? Because I said, I'll kick you off because you're on the scholarship. He, he's a really, uh, he's a lovely bloke. So, um, and I said, oh, you know, Benjamin we won't be able to do it. And then that happened in 12 months. Most people I meet do not predict that that would go back to full grass. But what we're not doing is looking and searching and making it happen. What is the combination of stock density, animal impact, utilisation and recovery that shifts that back to grass? You can't sit there and think your way through that. You will only drive yourself crazy. You've got to go and put the safe to fail trials in. Even if it doesn't work, you go, oh well, now I need to do it harder. Each time you learn. So, I've been saying it's a bit like the um, Mythbusters. If it doesn't blow up with a big enough bomb, you go and get a bigger bomb. You don't go, oh, that didn't work, because this is what we need to do. And I'm just trying to show people that that non-wetting sands, all the scientists said it wouldn't work, was a waste of time and money. That was the, with the MLA Sustainable Grazing Systems Project. And, you know, and I just kept getting told, no, no, no. And then um, I became chair of our group, South East South Australia and Western Victoria. And they came down and said, I've got to stop introducing fringe ideas into the sustainable grazing system. And I go, oh, you know, your timing's really bad because I've just been chairman for the last 12 months and I hate it because you can't introduce fringe ideas from the chair. I had to listen to everyone. And I'm going, oh God, this isn't working for me. <laughs> like so, but do you know what I mean? That was that they put pressure on me, and it was really interesting. But I was pretty immune to it. So he had two areas. So he had that first area that the animals got back on. That was why he said safe to fail that failed, uh, but it still was good enough to see the result. You're just trying to get a glimpse of what this. You know, Northern Africa was the granary of the Roman Empire. Do you know, and when you see that, you go, oh, of course it was. But when you see this, you go, how could that ever have been? How could Hannibal have walked his elephants through there? What would they have eaten? Do you know, 
It's like the whole, you know, the dinosaurs didn't eat grass nonsense. Well, what did they eat? What did a 40 ton animal go around nibbling a few ferns and a bit of tree? It just is stupid. <laughs> like, uh, so now they've extended that out to 66. It was always 25 million years before the grasses go. And now it's out to 66. And I go, yeah, and it'll keep going. You know, like, so. Yeah, so we need to know that we need to do these things to make it work. And how do I make it work? So non-wetting sands, like, this is another one. And this is uh, Jaime Elizondo's. He runs a total grazing school and stuff, and you can sign up online. So this had been grazed two to three times per year for over 12 years on the left. He grazed it once at total, oops, sorry, total grazing, total grazing as he calls it, so non-selective, and then left it for 12 months, and that's what came back. Because that just reminds me of so much of you know, that hay country or the Nullarbor or whatever. Do you know, like, so any of those things are possible, but you've got to do it. You've got to do it. And that's what I don't understand is when I present this information, I, I just cannot understand why people don't go, fantastic. But all of them then sit around, like in Gippsland, all they've been doing is writing emails to me on why this could ruin the world if people adopt it. I go, well, you know, they go, we'll only grow four tonnes of grass and at the moment we grow 12. And, you know, so they're trying to think their way about why it doesn't work. So I'm saying don't think, do. Just get on an act and work out how to do it. But people poo-poo, Jaime and Johan and things like that, but this happens all the time. So I'm going, you know, so there's not a long list. Most of, most of the others are doing that, what I call leaf area driven recovery. So graze the top third or graze the top 50%. It's all based on Frank Kreider's research in the grass, glass fronted trials. I've got the research that it's all based on. I don't see myself as an amateur in this area. You know, like I study it hard. And what the thing is, though, is, and it was the glass-fronted cabinets with, that were cut with scissors. So it just doesn't mimic real life. So there's a lot of things that just don't work. And Andre Voisin, in his book, Grass Productivity, he says, before doing this, it sounds very logical to leave that leaf area. But once you've done it, you realise immediately, and he says that, a, a priori, so prior to doing it, the research, it seemed logical, but it just doesn't work in practice. Because the animals don't graze by height, they graze by species. And you end up, if you do it for long enough, you end up losing the better grasses. You need to know that if the land's going well and it's got really high landscape function, big perennial grass basal areas and decomposing litter, you lose the decomposition of the litter first, if you're going to shorter recovery and not enough stock density and stuff, then you lose the litter, then you lose the perennial grasses on that way down as you're sliding down the slope, the slippery slope, you know, down this slope. So you need to know that you can pick it up. Oh, why is it the decomposition like it should it was last time I checked? Ah, and then take action and take action through a safe to fail trial. Confirm, uh-huh, I think it's this. Go and I'll send out a sheet that'll give you suggestions on corrective action. And you can go, oh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'll try it and do a trial. I'm not asking you to change. I'm asking you to do some trials to see how your land responds because this is incredibly difficult to organize and work out. But I've just got, I've just got heaps of this stuff, um, which I just find really um, interesting. So this was grazed with sheep at high stock density, summer through to sort of spring. The other thing is, I don't know how people are sorting out the world. So as soon as they say something to me, I'm gonna do some grazing stuff. And it's about the dung and urine. This is what my brain's saying. 
this is the major thing, recovery, stock density and utilisation. Have I said that today? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's some dung and urine and then everything else I've called it. Because everywhere I go they want to put in chicory, plantain, this grass, that species, this broadleaf, this... I'm going, hang on, this is about using this tool to develop a high landscape function perennial grassland. You might need to use some inputs on the way, but I've never found that to be the case. So in the safe to fail trial areas, and that was one of the questions, how do you do that? So I do at least three to five of these areas. So this one, I've been saying no inputs whatsoever. So this is your reference site. And then you might do uh, plus product X or plus some seed or plus something and then you compare them. One of the things is that whenever people do that, the question I ask in 12 months time is was that worth it? So I've done this with you know, like uh, compost teas, uh, all the biological inputs, biochar, I've done the lot and what I asked myself was for the time and effort, was it worth adding that? Elaine Ingham was really interesting on this because I was co-presenting at a thing with her and I'm going, oh, how's this going to go? And she goes, oh no, Graham, that's science. Well, she was happy, so. Um, and so, and, or if we go longer than 12 months, which is about that great migration, you know, the wildebeest and the zebras and stuff, this is out of sort of the tourist stuff on the South African tourist sites. They've got no skin in the game. They don't care what recovery is about. They've just got to tell the, the tourists where the, where the great migration is going to be. So they're, they're one of the few sites I can find actual information. Everyone making up stuff to fit their own story and narrative. But they've just got to tell the tourists. So, you know, they're carving down... Um, oh, they carved down here. I've got that wrong. Sorry. Um, and then, you know, so it's, the, it's a big cycle. But yeah, so we know, so Gabe Brown's on about 14 to 15 months. Uh, Peter Reynolds, that, where my cows are at Naringla, near Araluan, he's on about 14 months. So people are doing that. And I, we don't see it, but if you have that long a recovery, you've got to take it right down. Because if you skim it, it all just locks up and you get too much carbon and not enough nitrogen and stuff. You've actually got to put most of it through the animal to keep your ni carbon nitrogen balance. So with Skype and native grasses, the question is about how do you increase that di diversity because you rely on that viable soil seed bank and there's massive amounts of seed. So the work done by Dr. Ian Lunt at Western Melbourne showed that there was 15,000 volpia seeds per square metre in a healthy native grassland. And I go, wow, if that all germinated at once, you'd nearly cover that metre. So, do you know, so it's massive, this seed bank. And, but what we do with Stiper is you've got to learn to regenerate and germinate and establish perennial grasses through your grazing management and your trial areas. And then if things aren't coming back, you add some. So I had a thing that I couldn't get kangaroo grass back in southwest Victoria. It was growing on the roadside and it wouldn't come back and I was on six months recoveries. So I went over and I was presenting uh, just north of the airport, uh, the Hobart uh, or airport. And the guy there, he had kangaroo grass coming back. So I looked up the research. It needed a full soil profile to germinate and it needed these temperatures. You know, you know, it likes 22 degrees and all that. And I'm going, oh, that never happens in southwest Victoria. That, so it's not me, it's just that it, that it won't germinate. And he was down in <laughs> Tassie, his was germinating everywhere. I go, oh, operator error. And he was on 12 months recoveries. So we go to two years and we find that if it's been grazed at enough density, two year safe to fail trials, we haven't found that's at Naringla, so it depends on the distribution of atmospheric moisture and a few other things. But that two years seems to work fine. To bring that species you haven't seen in a long time. Yeah. 
Yep, and then what we're doing is we're looking for the recovery of those. If you had a high successional perennial grass, you only look at the recovery of those because then if you manage for the recovery of those, you'll increase them. Yep. Yeah, so you don't manage. So I had like a Phalaris paddock. Do you know if we lock up anything southwest Victoria, it goes to Phalaris. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone was saying, oh, it's because it's shading, it's because it's doing this, it's you know, out competing all the others. So I tried going faster and all it did was get more filaris. So I had to slow down, eat really deeply, provide germination sites for other things and long recoveries to allow them to establish. Yeah, so the germination sites are from the high density of the feet and I think it's got something to do with the twist. Okay. Do you know you, yeah. you, you, people that have got horses know the twist? I didn't know that until I was about 45. And I, go, and, and I couldn't get her off, she was deaf, dear Susie's horse, and I'm banging her in the ribs and she's going <laughs> on my foot. And I go, this is why we don't have handguns in Australia. I would have just gone boom. Because <laughs> I couldn't get her off, you know. And she thought I was leaning into her, you know. And, oh, isn't it nice? He's patting my ribs. I'm <laughs> going <laughs> Like, I go, God almighty, get off my foot. <laughs> so, so it's that twist that seems to do it. Um, this isn't coming out very well, but these are lanes with the water. I'm, I might have to uh, stop it and start it again over lunch and get it sorted out. So we have the water at one end and we just move that front fence. So two or three tapes and we're just moving. So we run, we run lanes or strips and then we just move that front fence up and move away from the water and then bring them back and do that. It's different on Peter Reynolds because he doesn't use gates and he has m portable water over the sort of 680 hectares or whatever and he just ducks them under the fence so that all his animals are trained to go under the fence and I'll, I'll show a little video of that after lunch as well but my cows when I shoot I could never get them to go under a tape they just would not they went to Peter's place if you don't go under the tape you don't get fed so they just did it so and it's really funny so um, but that's what I'm advocating I've done research with this I've actually had, I split a group down in the North Central CMA around Bendigo. Half of them went for the lanes and strips and half of them wanted to go with the cells with the radial fencing. The people with the radial fencing were still failing and struggling within two years, whereas the ones with the strips were enjoying it more profitable and increasing landscape function and biodiversity. I taught cells, because that was what Alan Savory taught me in 96. I taught cells for sort of over 10 years. But I think that they're anachronistic now because when Alan came up with the cell design, water was still in galvanised iron pipe. And it was in that big arid country in Zimbabwe. And with water, the way we can do it now, I just don't think it's the best, but that doesn't go so well for a lot of people. Um, Sort of, but I'm saying I don't think Peter's cells work. Well, I'll show you the photo. Peter's place is steeper than here, mm. and we run those laneways up the hill so that we're, when we're running the tapes, we're walking on, we're walking on the contour. So what I'm doing with those safety fails, I get people to do some areas, and then I get them to do some of this as a safety fail. Do you like it? And people go, Oh, I really like it. You know, so. You know, there's got to be enjoyable, but the frequency of the movement is really a problem. And that's why we've got, we use bat latches. This is what the barriers are to regen ag, and this is the barriers for most things, is you can have these barriers and these are the tools to address them. This is work done by Doug Mackenzie Moore from uh, cbsm.com, but it'll be in the, the notes. So most people think that it's lack of motivation. I've never found that to be a barrier. Most people, because if it was a barrier, you could provide people with incentives and they'd be successful. I go, you could op offer most people that have been trained in grazing management, $10 million and if you're successful over the next couple of years, they still wouldn't be successful. They don't know what to do. There was only one guy that said, oh, I'd, I'd get you and split it, five million to you and five. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, well, they'd have to get someone, but you couldn't, it's not lack of motivation on their point, on their part, it's actually the majority of time it's structural barriers. And this wasn't what I thought. I thought it'd be knowledge and motivation, but when I studied it, it was structural barriers, forgetting to act, and then enough knowledge. It wasn't lack of knowledge, it was actually getting those structural barriers, doing this, being able to see it, actually going and visiting places on what's the best fencing design, how do I design for hills. Like, and the cows, see I taught whole farm planning for the DPI in Victoria, I know land class, I know all that stuff. But it's not relevant if they're only moving small areas. So the cows don't care if they're walking uphill, downhill or across the hill, if they're only going like that. And we don't back fence them until we find that we've either got to move the water up to them. So one of the things we're always doing is we're monitoring. And when you go out to look at the animals, you've got to ask yourself, and this is Dave Snowden stuff, we, you need to see, you need to pay attention, you need to act. So with all the people that, that sort of haven't had animals, I'm going, do they look different? Do they smell different? Are they behaving different? and it gets them up paying attention, looking at them. And that works really well then. Well, what is it? And what we've found on Peter's place is that it's usually the water's too far away. So they'll be looking dry and grumpy and all that sort of stuff. It's one of those, it's one of those adaptive things. It doesn't matter, it changes. So they sometimes won't walk up the hill. They sometimes won't walk down the hill. We go, so you just don't worry about it, you just shift the water when they won't do it. Yeah. But we shift the water with them and then we might back fence because some of those lanes in Peters are five kilometres long and then we'll put a back fence and just shift them forward. But basically we don't shift the water very frequently. I always went down the beach sort of for you know, December, January down at Port Ferry and I'd put trainees on but if I couldn't get a trainee to be doing it, and they thought they were lolly on a stick, it was very funny. I'd put them in and they'd have the big house and oh, da, 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 and they'd think they were really special for about four days and then uh, the novelty would wear off and they're going, oh, it's very tough. <laughs> you know, like, so, yeah, because they were, they, they were tasked with getting good gut fill, good dung scores, and that they were drinking properly. They had a checklist that they had to go through. And they'd go, oh, I can't get the gut fills. They'd ring up and be really stressed and stuff. So, you know, when we'd run into one of those hot spells. You know, it, has, it has a few siphons up, but then we just run a 200 metre uh, up on the ground Rock. and we can get to most spots. Yeah. So just the last bit, sort of, we, so we get more flexibility. Yeah. And it's not big. It's like that inch HPN or whatever it is, that blue. No, the blue. Yeah, and then we go to a white hose into the trough and it's a stainless steel trough on skids and everyone goes it's really funny why don't you put it on wheels but it's like yeah you know, <laughs> if you put it on wheels it's going to end up down the bottom <laughs> you know, like so but it's very funny so and that convenience this works really well if those distances aren't too big so this is just Mongolia um, this was a, a control area and that was a treatment area that I did I couldn't get them to do stock density I wanted them to do about a hectare, and they did 10 square kilometres, sort of thing. Okay, uh, it's sort of different out here, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah so I had, we had great success out there, and uh, they're very irreverent, they hate authorities. There was something about us, that, uh, about me, that really engaged with them. So, yeah, so we had a good time. But um, I won't do that, but that's that bat latch thing that we use to shift the animals. So this is a steel post. Uh, with a bit of PVC pipe. It's got these two cut off grinding wheels with on the inside of that's a porcelain insulator. And then it's got a string of poly wire that runs right round. And then and it's got this hammer head hooked to the string. So when, um, uh, so it's tight there. So when the hammer falls, it lifts the, the up and they all move under. Peter MacGyver Reynolds, as I call him, he, he developed this. And I go, you should go into production, Peter. The only thing that's holding you back is you haven't got enough old hammerheads. <laughs> you know, like so, yeah, or cut off wheels and things like that. But it works, and it works really well. 
So we have, uh, we spend about 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the evening shifting tapes and setting up bat latches and stuff. So, and we can graze at any stock density with that amount of work, so. But it is, it's repetitive and, um, and some of those other things that if you have the weekend off and give them a bigger area, the microbes in the guts shift. And then you've got to sort of, I wean them back on to the, the dry feet so that they have to start working hard again. Whereas Peter does a hard reset, he calls it. So he starves them until they start eating again. So, so the, you know, when you say, oh, the cows don't like the native grasses or the horses won't eat that or whatever, it's not that they don't like it, it's that the rumen bugs or the hindgut bugs are in the wrong spot. They can't process it, so they will not eat it. So when it's drying off at the end of, um, end of spring into summer, we always graze the hills because they weren't going to get any better yeah. and then save the flats and the, the camp creek flat and stuff so for, for into feb because it was then it was like a balanced diet all the way through so so there's two ideas you know how to do your own trials to work out what your land mm -hmm. was and this other stuff is what i train people in with the laneways and the multiple moves and the high high stock density, high utilisation with long recoveries. So keep them separate because you can use, always use the safe to fail trials. You mightn't like what I'm saying, but it's the only thing that I've found to work, which is really disappointing.